welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Rafael Sertoli is a self-learner and a self-experimenter. A decade before starting on his scientific path, he started adopting various low-carb diets and lifestyle practices to improve his health. Rafael has resolved multiple health issues, such as allergies, asthma, poor digestion, brain fog, low energy levels, and joint pain. He is the host of the Break Nutrition Podcast, which I highly recommend. He has been featured in shows of all kinds and stages all over the world. He has written articles for CrossFit, The Nutrition Coalition, Perfect Keto, Keto Mojo, among others. He has helped develop the Nutrita app, designed to show nutritional information that actually matters. Currently, he is pursuing his PhD in Health Sciences in the Molecular Lab at the University of Minho in Portugal, studying neuroscience and metabolism. Rafael Sertoli, it is an absolute honor and pleasure to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Hi, Casey. Thank you so much for having me. That was a, that was a great uh, intro. <laughs> and uh, it, it feels good to hear all of the improvements I managed to make, make to my health over the years when you, when you put it like that. Man, <laughs> and so many people experience those things and j- they just accept them as like normal. And it's, it's more like it's average. Like so many people experience them that they think that should be kind of like, you know, normal. And it's just, it just really isn't, is it? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was a pretty uh, athletic kid growing up. I used to do a lot of sports and spend, uh, you know, I used to spend a lot of time outside in nature. So I certainly wasn't, you know, to, uh, I I wasn't in a bad situation or anything, but I did have asthma. I did have, you know, uh, allergies. I did have, you know, some, some joint pain, which when you're 20 or 22, that's not normal. You shouldn't really have any joint pain. So, you know, it's uh, just a, a few things um, uh, that really improved. Um, so, uh, you know, not, everything is not perfect, but my health is certainly much better. And I was very, very lucky to learn about low carb diets and nutrition science in general. So wow. that's, that's part of why I got into this. Uh, uh, also, thanks to Gary Taubes, whose book I read, um, Good Calories, Bad Calories. Yeah, that's so, it's so amazing how many people can trace their history and low-carb diets back to Gary Tobbs and his book. It's cool that that was such an influence for you. Yeah, he's, he's a very good investigative journalist who gets to know the subject he's, he's uh, writing about uh, at a very deep level. And he always takes you back in time, really, through the history of it. Because when you can take that long, long-term perspective, you can have a better idea of how ideas evolve. And mm-hmm. that's, that's key to understanding, you know, where the field is going, what, what's promising, what isn't. And um, yeah, he, he provides a very valuable perspective. And I think he galvanized a lot of people in the, in the sphere and sort of, you know, renewed a whole industry of, of low carbon keto, which of course has a lot of commercial interest as well nowadays. So it's kind of, it's interesting how someone's investigations can, can sort of, you know, change industries. So amazing. That's so cool. I want to talk about all that. I want to talk about the app that you developed and, you know, the, the, all the content that you put out, which is vast. But before I do, I refuse to host somebody who has grown up and currently lives in France and not talk about my absolute favorite event, a sporting event ever. And I, I have to ask you about the Tour de France. Is there, is there any special memories that you have with the Tour de France being, a, a, you know, growing up in France? Yeah, so the Tour de France is definitely you know a, a big deal um, where where I'm from, and I I grew up basically one hour from the city of Nice, which is on the seaside, and this is the part of the Alps where you know you can you you get um, so you're if you're on a bike and you're riding from the sea, you'll have this uh, you know big flat area. Uh, that's following this river and then you start to go up into the mountains which is where where I grew up basically my family's a mountain house and you have some of the roads that we used to drive up that would be you know um, used by the the cyclists so it was amazing to see the speed at which they could they could climb that or even just go go down it you know these are very steep narrow windy roads with rocks and and, and stuff on the side that are sort of jagged and you have to be careful to know the road. So it's, uh, it's, it's crazy what these guys can accomplish. And, and so it, it's never been a passion of mine. I'm, I was more into soccer and, and martial arts when I was a kid, 
but I got interested in cycling from the metabolic and sports nutrition perspective because a lot of the studies are done on cyclists, actually. So a lot of the keto studies on sports performance were done in cyclists, and I got more interested uh, uh, from it uh, later on in, in, in my years. But um, uh, do, do you ride a... Do you uh, ride ride a bike? I do. Is that um, your your passion? Yeah, I do. I mean, for us in America, it was you know kind of Lance Armstrong that got us all you know interested in cycling. We know obviously yeah. how that all turned out, but yeah, I mean, learning about the, the I, sport and following the Tour de France on TV over here is just something that's special for us. So I just I can't imagine like like being you know driving up those roads and that you know some of the most you know crazy and mythical things have ever happened in cycling. It's just so cool, so cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I know Peter Atia is really into cycling, and and he probably has a lot of uh, anecdotes to to give you. But I just I just remember watching it on TV, and my dad would put it on, you know, in the afternoon, and you'd watch it, and you'd be like, oh yeah, this is about an hour from where I live. It's super <laughs> cool, you know. How can they be doing this? I I always drive this road, and they're just cycling up it like it's nothing. So wow. yeah, I have I have those good memories. That's so amazing, so cool. So tell us a little bit about how you got interested in nutrition to get started. Yeah, it was when I was about in my, so it was in my early twenties. Um, I can't remember who, but someone gave me the good calories, bad calories book by Gary Taubes. And first time I read it, it was, it was very dense and I couldn't, I couldn't really see what it was trying to get at really. So I put it down and came back to it a few months later. And when I picked it up the second time, um, it was revolutionary for me because it gave a really good historical overview of you know, why we started measuring cholesterol and that, that it was easy to measure. That was one of the first things we could measure. And the other things that, you know, count like lipid, uh, you know, particle size or whatever, we couldn't really do that yet to the same extent. So we sort of focused on what we could, uh, what we could measure. And that's just a good example of how, you know, scientists are, are you know, like every other human, very pragmatic and flawed and short-sighted. And it was just a great lesson in scientific research, how it's done. And, you know, of course, um, you know, illuminating some very important uh, facts about uh, health that I had to, well, I couldn't really ignore. And it slowly crept into my mind that I should be uh, thinking about what I'm eating and and sort of you know just try to experiment, which which meant essentially cutting out bread and sugar for me in the first part and the seed oils. Although we I never really use seed oils uh, because we use olive oil and lard and butter uh, where where I grew up. Um, but we would you know I wouldn't think of it when I went out for a fast food or uh, at the restaurant or something. I'd still have seed oil, so that came later on. Um, but it all started with the low carb approach and and really the the very enthralling science and sort of politics and behind the scenes uh, stuff that that happened that you know made me want to explore this further and try to understand some some deeper aspects than simply epidemiology, which is a lot of nutrition science. So I started to read a lot of. Uh, uh, Peter uh, of Hyperlipid. Uh, that is a fantastic blog, very dense, very science uh, heavy blog that um, espouses the sort of a low carb perspective on nutrition and metabolism. And this is something I was reading maybe in 2013 or something, 2014. I can't even remember when it, when he first started to, to put things up there, but it was, it was really difficult for me because I didn't have, you know, any scientific training beyond high school and, I was very keen to understand what he was talking about uh, with this mitochondria and these electrons and, you know, how food gets broken down. So this was very alien to me. Uh, so I really got uh, into studying. So I just, you know, would get textbooks, download them off the internet and just start taking notes like, like you would if you were in a biology class. And I was just doing this on my spare time because it was uh, interesting. And I was starting to get some of the stuff and that was very rewarding and, I, I told myself, well, I might as well get some sort of degree of recognition for all the time I'm spending. So I, I, that's how I got into my, my master's. It was really to try to figure out what this guy, this uh, vet in London who is talking about you know, human metabolism, and he's, he's always been one of my favorite thinkers in the space uh, ever since. Um, so yeah, if you, if anyone who's a bit geeky and wants to get in, uh, into metabolism very deeply, they can check out Peter, uh, Peter's blog. It's uh, hyperlipid. 
Uh, so I highly recommend that. So it was a mix of Gary Taubes and, and Peter of Hyperlipid. So a journalist and a vet <laughs> who really got me into, so uh, into nutrition and, and science. Wow. It's so crazy, but that's the world we're living in, right? It's like, it's, it's almost like it's coming up from the ground and journalists and scientists and, and, you know, software engineers, people you wouldn't expect are being told this information from the medical world. And they have, you know, the time and the resources to go out and question and do research and they see things in a different light. And it's almost like all of the best information is coming up from the ground, not necessarily from the top down. Yeah. I mean, there are some, there are some top researchers who are exceptional, but I would say that in, in scientifically exceptional, but they're, they're the exception. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like anything. You can be a career scientist and you can be very good at that, whatever that means, you know, being, having a lot of publications, having your names in newspapers, you know, some people are just great at that, but to be someone who's creative, who's original, who's doing important work, who's, who's asking the questions that aren't maybe that easy to fund, but who, that have a lot of importance, you know, those are the people who do a lot of the grunt work. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it, it doesn't take, um, it takes a, a certain kind of person. That's why sci a scientist for me is more of a vocational thing than a job. I mean, mm. uh, 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 you, people say that of doctors, right? You, it's not just a job, it's a vocation. And I get that. That's, that's a fair, you know, you, you, you could say that, but I think it's the same for science because it's, uh, it's difficult. It's, uh, it's you have to be sort of disagreeable with not only your ideas, but other people's ideas. I mean, and it's hard because we, we tend to be very interpersonal. And so it's hard to separate ourselves from from our ideas. And it's it's hard in a one on one interaction. And it's hard when we're thinking about our own ideas, mm. um, you know, not to be not to, to get stuck with those the ones that we originally had and they're familiar and they're comfortable and we frame things with them. So. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a vocation and it's not for the, you know, you have to be patient sure, humble, <laughs> and you humble. don't have to mind, uh, you know, yeah. And you have to, and nowadays, I mean, you can get very creative with fun, with funding, right? I mean, there, there are people who have all sorts of, of good funding ideas, but uh, for the most part, the mainstream science funding is very slow. You know, it's very, it's glacial. It's, it's not very exciting. Uh, it's very uh, sort of results oriented. It's not very, um, sort of from first principles, which gives you things like the internet and, and you know, nuclear physics, but we kind of tend to forget that <laughs> this work came from a lot of creative work and not from some sort of board meeting set, you know, sort of target. Sure. Yeah. No, I love that you mentioned, you know, how to be a good scientist. And I, I think back to Gary Tobbs and one of his favorite quotes is like, you know, you have to, you have to be willing to give up your ideas and, or, or something like that. I'm paraphrasing, but like, you're the easiest one to trick. Like once you're married to an idea, it's really hard to not let your ego get involved and grasp that thing when a good scientist is always trying to prove themselves wrong. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Yeah, so very I, difficult. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agreed. So, so this diet changed your health, uh, changed your fitness, changed your life that way. It also changed your career, which is amazing. Um, I'm curious to know how your diet has evolved over time. There seems to be a bit of a progression that people take. You mentioned removing, you know, the the sugar and the and the flour. Seed oil wasn't really a big thing, but how did your diet progress over time? And and what kinds of things do you include in your diet today? So my my diet started my diet changed because I was never really thinking about uh, food beyond like oh what's what's super tasty and and stuff like that it was very su superficial in a sense so when I started thinking about it I removed the the flour so the bread um, I went lower carb and I back then I used so this was maybe you know over close to you know seven to eight years now. Um, I started by going low carb. I had a lot of vegetables, um, some fruit, you know, some starches, uh, some dark chocolate, some dairy, uh, very little alcohol. Um, you know, it was a it was a it was a great diet. I think most people would do very well on on that diet. And you know, I was I wasn't eating a lot of seed oils. Maybe a bit more omega six than what I would think is optimal nowadays, but. It was pretty good overall is, you know, good quality olive oil, butter, lard, coconut oil. And, and that was great. Um, but I, I ended up developing um, what I've, I'm pretty sure, you know, is, is now ulcerative colitis. Um, you know, it tends to happen in your mid-20s. Um, and that's what happened to me. And 
I had made some very positive dietary changes, you know, about a year or two before that and had a lot of benefit, but it still just sort of appeared as it seems to do, um, which is not uncommon in people who already have an autoimmune condition, such as myself, because uh, I, I have, uh, uh, well, I had asthma uh, as a kid, um, and that is basically non-existent now. Um, but in, in any case, this, uh, this uh, ulcerative colitis condition which is one of the inflammatory bowel disorders where you can get um, you can get a lot of diarrhea, you can have pain, you can have inflammation, you can have bloody stools, you can have you know undigested food particles. Um, it can cause you to lose weight. Um, you know, it's uh, it's can it can be pretty bad. You know, it's an autoimmune condition, and um, people should listen to my episode with uh, Nick Norwitz on my YouTube channel where he talks about his ulcerative colitis experience, and his was way more severe than mine. Mine was like, you know, it's funny because also I had, although I had some of those symptoms, um, you know, I was gaining weight. I was in a great mood. I had a lot of energy, you know, a lot of my blood work was fantastic. So it was, it was this kind of strange situation where a lot of things got better, but this one um, autoimmune condition popped up. And since then I've been managing it by removing plant material for the most part. And, you know, paying attention to factors that affect uh, my immune system, like how much sunshine I get, um, you know, am I socializing, am I, um, you know, not, uh, for example, e eating inflammatory uh, components or inhaling toxic substances that are not good for me that can provoke uh, autoimmune, you know, reactions or that can exacerbate inflammation. So I try to pay attention to, to these things. And for the most part, a more, let's say a 95, 90, 98% carnivore diet has uh, helped quite a lot. It's, um, it's improved aspects of my digestion and inflammation. Um, it hasn't fixed the ulcerative colitis like it has for a lot of people, but it has, uh, you know, given me a lot of improvements. And, you know, I, I really enjoy the way I eat um, you know, in France, we get, we have, there's a lot of good food, right? We have foie gras, we have all sorts of raw full fat cheese. Uh, we have great, you know, smoked, smoked fish and organ meats, which I personally really enjoy and you can slow cook. And I mean, there's a lot of variety, even on a plant restricted diet, like, like I am for these, uh, digestive reasons, but, uh, yeah. That's that's been my my progression in a nutshell. Wow, that's great. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, Dr. Nick Norwitz. We just interviewed him um, a few days ago, and yeah, he he mentioned oh, cool. just being in like the depths of despair and like total pain, like terrified at, at his valedictorian speech in Dartmouth that he was going to have an episode, and he could have been bleeding. He could have you know had to go to the bathroom immediately. Like so terrible. It's it's amazing how prevalent that is too. So many people experience that. We also have a former guest, Dr. Mickey Bendor, which you've done some work with in the past. And we talked a little bit about, um, you know, carnivorous diets and our evolution. Can you comment on how compatible a carnivore style diet is compatible with our evolution and what we used to eat in the past? So I think that's a great question. And it's also the right way to frame it because the, the, com it, the, com the question of compatibility and whether we're adapted to the way we eat is really the right way to frame the food choices that we make, because this really is sort of appreciative of the theory of evolution by natural selection. And I think it doesn't get its, its due in, in nutrition. And I think a carnivore diet is compatible with humans. It's very compatible, in fact. And the reason is that we have so many different pieces of evidence that indicate that we consumed a lot of meat. So I'll just name a few just to give you an idea, but there really are, you know, 25 or more that, that we uh, de detailed in our paper that Mickey was the uh, first author on, a good, a good friend of mine and his uh, thesis supervisor, Rand Barkai. And we argued that humans were hyper carnivores for several different reasons, including gut anatomy. So we have a very small gut and a very large brain, and this is how we see the human, um, the, the, the human anatomy evolved. Our brains got bigger, our guts got shorter. We see this in, in other animals as well. We have a very acidic, so a very low pH level. So this means that we're very good at scavenging and digested you know, food that can 
be somewhat fermented, have some spoilage on it. Mm. We're very good at dealing with that. So this is what you would expect of a hyper carnivore and especially a hyper carnivore that started out by scavenging as humans did. They would scavenge carcasses, break open the bones with the stone tools, break open the, the skull, access the brain, access the marrow, get a lot of those extra calories, extra fat. You know, there's a lot of advantages that come from this because not a lot of animals can do this. There are a few animals that can drop objects and, and access uh, the interior, whether that's nuts. Maybe some can do it with bones, but not to the extent that we could. It was, it was pretty impressive what we managed to scavenge. So we have the guts for it. We also have the genetics. Um, a lot of our genetics points to a um, what's called a chromatin landscape that was really geared towards increased uh, reliance on fat. And that is fat from our own fat stores and fat from the, from the diet. So we have a, a huge capacity to, to use fat to our advantage. We're very uh, fatty primates, you know, compared to other primates who only have a, a few percentage points of fat. You know, humans are above 10, 20 you know, naturally. So this is this is really something that's super important to us and, and is important in how diabetes is affecting us today. So it has a lot of ramifications. There's also, um, you know, the fact that we're bipedal, that we can, uh, we have the technology for hunting. It's in our cultural lore. Um, it's literally in our bones. When we look at the stable isotopes, we see that, that the, the, the accumulation of isotopes of carbon and nitrogen or oxygen, you know, they really do paint the picture of this animal that could obtain a lot of predators that were high up on the food chain. And in fact, we were probably apex predators. We were even trophically above wolves, which is uh, remarkable considering how much meat wolves can, can chow down on. So you can, you can imagine that with the intelligence, with the tools for hunting, we were able to access these animals at a rate that other species weren't. And in fact, this is, this is so much the case that we seem to have hunted a lot of large fatty animals like mammoths and, and elephants. We seem to have hunted some of these to extinction. Mm. Um, it was believed to be um, you know, solely due to the climate or some other factor. And it seems to be in large part, you know, anthropogenically derived, I mean, from humans, from our activity, from our hunting. So we were incredibly good at accessing meat, storing it, um, you know, and, and divvying it up against uh, uh, within the tribe. So there's a lot of evidence. Um, and we've received some really interesting criticisms of, of our paper, notably by Herman Ponser and I just did a podcast episode with him. So if you want to hear the <laughs> other side of the story, you can you can check it out on my YouTube channel as well. But it's a it was a very big paper that we had to cut down at least in half to get it <laughs> to submit it to the journal. Wow. Um, and it, it's a bit of a different approach than the typical the, the more narrow approach that's that's typical of uh, anthropology. So we tried to do something that you know took a lot of uh, different um, uh, knowledge bases, whether that's metabolism, genetics, uh, anatomy from archaeology to, you know, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of climate data, uh, you know, there, there's a lot there to, to go through to have a complete picture because we can't simply look at the modern hunter gatherer, gatherer tribes. You know, those are limited in what they can tell us. We have to be very cautious about, the, what we call ecological confounding, meaning how much they can actually reflect the conditions that humans were in back then. Um, did they have access to the same animals? You know, we, ha we have to ask these questions. And, and when we did that, we found a picture that was favorable to a hypercarnivore pattern of eating, which is more than 70% of your calories from animal foods, um, which uh, I should just mention is, is totally compatible with um, healthy omnivores. That's totally compatible. It's just that we, that's the direction we, we tended to go in. And it's maybe not surprising that we see a lot of uh, conditions, modern diseases that tend to do better when we revert closer to that pattern. I think we should, we should make, make note of that. Yeah. Patients. 
Wow. I'm just, I'm so glad you mentioned that. You guys hit every bucket. Like, it's so wide. It explains so many different things. It's not one thing in isolation. And yeah, we asked Dr. Bendor, like, what are humans? Are humans carnivores or herbivores or are we omnivores? And without hesitation, he said omnivore, but we specialize. It doesn't mean you can't have plants, but we specialize in meat. And I think a lot of people don't realize that there is a difference, e even if you're eating equal parts you know, nutrient wise, let's say a plant has this many nutrients and meat has the same amount of nutrients. Can you tell us a little bit about the absorbability and the difference between plant foods and animal foods? So the, the way this happens is that different plants have different ratios of amino acids than humans do. And they come in a different matrix of food. So there are some differences there, not only, not only in the quantity of the actual amino acids that you're going to be using, but there's also a difference in the food matrix in which they're, they're brought in. And our stomach is better geared at absorbing the protein from animals than it is the protein from plants. Now we can make good use of the protein from plants, but we're better off in terms of efficiency, right? How much we can absorb per gram of food and sort of the metabolic uh, utility that we can get out of it because we have these amino acids in the ratios that we uh, require, require. So there are several different advantages. So there's the digestibility, there's the bioavailability, you know, there are the amino acid ratios, and then there's all the other nutrition that is along for the ride in those different sources, right? You have, you know, a lot of um, B vitamins, you have, you know, a lot of minerals like zinc and maybe even some vitamin D. So you have a lot of things in animals' foods that you don't get in plant foods. And, and protein is maybe one of the most notable differences that, that people often refer to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's protein and it's more. It's also the nutrients that, that come with it and all of that that we should be paying attention to. So um, we, we tend to, in evolutionarily speaking, there's a role for plant foods uh, that sometimes some people have called uh, fallback foods, and that's what tubers uh, seem to be for, for humans to a large extent. Other puts uh, put more importance to them than, than we do in the paper. Um, but ultimately, the, the highest quality of, of protein that you're going to get is from the staple meats, not the fallback foods from, from plants. Mm. And I think as somebody becomes more aware of those things, they want to they want to try to make sure that they are getting the right amount of nutrients, they're getting the right amount of protein. Um, you know, they 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 want to track and make sure that everything is going well for them. And I think it would it would be pretty obvious early on that if you're choosing more of a plant based diet, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to keep the carbohydrates where they need to be. But going back to you know tracking a, a calorie tracker can be a, a useful tool. Um, for some people, as long as it doesn't confuse them. So when did calorie tracking become, you know, a, a, in your field of consciousness, something that, that you wanted to try? And when did you notice that there were flaws in what was being, you know, offered by the calorie trackers available? Yeah. So it's interesting because I never needed to use a calorie tracker for myself. And I was always sort of skeptical of, of them because they, it seemed too, too simple to be true. And it, and it turned out to be the case that it's, it's just not as easy as counting your calories to, to lose fat. But I mean, they're useful to the extent that they keep people accountable for things that they want to experiment with, that it helps them remain organized, that it can help them make some, you know, very sort of inaccurate estimates, which for some practical purposes may be totally fine. So they're, they're okay if we take them at that level. Where the problem is, is where they make promises that they can't keep. For instance, they can't, they pretend that they're accurately tracking your caloric intake, but that's not possible. You couldn't, you wouldn't be able to, to do it in free living conditions. Um, there's going to be changes in your energy expenditure that you might not be aware of, that you may not be able to to measure, um, it it can it could fluctuate. So these differences add up, and when you take a calorie centric approach, you quickly realize that there's a lot of effort you can expend counting calories, whilst your body fat percentage can keep increasing. So you're not fixing the underlying issue of body composition, 
And weight can be quite treacherous in that way as well, because depending on how you're losing um, your weight, you could be losing rel a relatively high amount of muscle. And, and that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for that improved ratio of muscle to, to fat. So there are several ways in which calorie tracking is not only, um, well, I, I tend to say it's not even wrong because it's, it's, not, it's addressing an issue of biology at the level of physics. So it's missing the point that, um, you know, obesity is not a question of excess calories. It's uh, uh, you get excess calories as a result of obesity, which is an expansion mm -hmm. in fat mass that is, you know, unhealthy. So the, the perspective is confused and the apps perpetuate that because, of course, it lends itself to gamification counting. And understanding that my, my impulse was to say, well, you know, people you have their phones with them all the time and they need to have some notion of what they're eating just to just to so they can educate themselves and get some data that's not, you know, that's firsthand data, right? They're not taking it from an authority. And so I I, I was interested in what how can you do this better? And this is where I was speaking with my colleague uh, Gabor and with some other uh, partners, we we decided that you know an insulin index was a pretty pretty interesting tool, and this insulin index was uh, similar to the glycemic index, which is something people will be familiar with. Um, but this insulin index was is telling you how much insulin you're secreting in response to food, and the idea is that this is a this is a more interesting measure of the direction you're taking your metabolism uh, with respect to obesity and other uh, conditions uh, such as diabetes uh, than is calorie counting because calorie counting is inaccurate because it's not getting at the root of the, of the issue, um, that it's, it's uh, giving you all of these sort of illusions and false promises. So let's track something that's more meaningful biologically. And we think that insulin so far is our best bet at understanding, are you getting closer or further away from a fat burning state? Most likely. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the, the utility of the insulin index and the keto score, which is sort of the reciprocal of this index, meaning if you're trying to get into ketosis, you want your insulin to be low and you want to choose foods that are not very insulinogenic. And the higher your keto score, the lower your insulin secretion tends to be because low insulin means higher ketones. Higher ketones is a sign of you know, a lot of fat being turned over, right? A lot of fat being released from tissue, converted into ketones, um, distributed in the blood. Um, so it's it's uh, two scores, the insulin index and the keto score are two scores that um, I developed along with uh, the colleagues in my company to basically have this as the centerpiece of our app, uh, Nutrita, for users that were specifically interested in losing fat, but of course people also had diabetes and you know they just wanted to eat a more nutrient dense diet. So these things were possible as well, but the, the centerpiece was, you know, you know, the insulin index and the keto score as ways for people to lose fat uh, that's not calorie counting and, and that's something closer to the biology of the problem they're trying to address. Mm. I, that is so well explained and so smart of you guys to really focus on the things that matter because you're right. Most people, when they download a calorie tracker, they see the, the, you know, the priorities on these calorie trackers, calories, how much fat, um, maybe sodium, uh, maybe, maybe there is sugar on there, maybe not, usually not. And they're all upper limits. Like you have to stay under all of these things versus what you guys are doing is, is like really putting a high emphasis on nutrient dense foods. And I downloaded the app and it's great. It's really easy to use. It's easy to understand the foods that, you know, contribute to health. And there's no, there's not necessarily like an upper limit to those foods, but can you talk a little bit about like nutrient density, what that means and where we can find more nutrient dense foods? Yeah. So the nutrient density score, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because it's my favorite. It's, 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 it's the by far the hardest to work on, and it's the score where there's the most progress to be made because the science about like what's nutritious and and you know the best ways to to get your nutrition they're terrible. 
they're terrible. I mean, that's one, you know, like people say you should invest in infrastructure. And a lot of, I think most people will agree that, you know, investing in infrastructure is a good idea when your roads aren't, aren't working well. Well, it's kind of the same for nutrition science. We should be investing in studies to understand the nutrition and how to get the most out of your food. And we, we, we're not doing enough of that. And that means that we have bad nutrient density scores. The labels on your food is not really that accurate. And it's not giving you a good representation of what you're actually getting and what you could be getting, most importantly. So one of the things we wanted to try to do with the score was to say, okay, Let's take whatever the data we can get, and it's not easy to get great data, but we, we've, we've managed to find some high quality data for you know tens of thousands of foods. So that was gonna give us a large enough base upon which to build this score. And then we applied you know, principles of evolutionary biology, the RDAs, the DRIs, the adequate intakes, and all of these things. And we, we try to adjust for the known biological effects as best as we could. And we're limited, of course, by, by the, the studies. But we, we could uh, get some more accurate 0 to 10 scores uh, um, that could tell you, okay, did I eat a nutritious diet today? Did I eat something that, was, that had value for me, nutritionally speaking? Mm. And we, we could do that because we had an understanding of how plants and animals are handled by our biology differently. And because we understand that if you have, you know, certain foods are going to have more anti-nutrients that are going to bind nutrients, they're going to impede the absorption. So you're going to be losing out on what is actually in the food because you're not absorbing it from the food. Um, we're going to pay attention to the fact that when you're getting a carrot, you're getting beta carotene, which is not retinol, which is not the active in, um, uh, form of uh, vitamin A. And there's a conversion and there's a cost to that conversion and we can estimate it and we can factor it in. And this is the stuff that should have been happening, you know, at the government level on food labels and nobody was doing it. So we did, we, we had our best, uh, you know, we made our best attempt at it. And, and we came up with this nutrient density score that, you know, I think is pretty helpful if you really don't know what food is nutritious. You have no idea what humans should be eating. You just know what you've heard on TV. And that's, that's pretty terrible for any of us, right? If that's where we get our, our science. Um, well, you're going you're gonna to probably have a better idea of, of how to eat a healthier diet if you can get a, a good score. Because we're going to give you a good score for stuff like, you know, salmon, and beef and eggs and you know kale and an apple then we are going to give you for pizza and donuts and stuff like that so if we can if we can make that easier for you then i think we we can call that a win and and yeah it was my favorite thing to work on because it was it was challenging it was it was not easy to put together it doesn't seem like it would be easy to put together i mean how long did it take for you to develop this we had about, uh, I would say, nine to 10 months of just pure R&D, uh, mainly uh, our main developer, Thomas, who is, who is excellent, uh, mix of computer science and nutrition science, and then you know, my, my knowledge in the area. And, and together, uh, he did much of the machine learning on, on all of this, uh, all of it, actually. And, and you know, I tried to contribute as much as I can about the science that, that, that I knew. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a team effort. And like most things in, most things in science, you want to take a multidisciplinary approach. And, you know, I don't know anything about machine learning, but, but I do know something about food. And, and you know, with his help, we, we did something that's, that's pretty good. And hopefully we can keep, keep improving on it and people are, are asking for it. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's so much better to team up with people who are, you know, experts in their fields where you're not necessarily, you know, so educated on. Um, tell me who, in, in your vision, you've kind of already alluded to this, but in your vision, who is the perfect candidate to use this tracker? Um, mostly people who will want to lose fat and anyone who's trying to do some, some simple macro tracking, but wouldn't mind having a good a, a good general idea as, uh, you know, are, are they getting most of the nutrients that they could be getting? You know, if, if that's a concern for them, and you know they're they're looking for something a little more sophisticated. Uh, you know they'll be happy with the nutrient density score and 
and the other two scores, the keto score or the insulin index or the insulin load for fat loss. So it's really about fat loss and, and nutrient density. But we, we have some people who also come for blood sugar, uh, blood sugar lowering uh, interventions that they can't seem to get from their from their doctor or or with the medications they're on. So you know, we, we, we can't give any medical advice, but we can tell them what things lower their blood sugar and to make sure they tell their doctor to adjust the medications down when they get some improvement. So there's, there's some interest there as well. Mm. I love that you mentioned the, the nutrients, the, the micronutrients, and that's, that's really apparent um, how much you guys focus on that as well, because I think that can be you know, really overlooked and missed. Um, how, how would you like to see the app evolve over time? What, what things are, are you looking forward to improving? I would love to have um, some more one-on-one -on -one coaching integrated into the service because I think ultimately we're, we're in a society where a lot of the efforts people go through to improve their health can be pretty lonely, um, whether it's because they don't feel that they get the information that they're looking for or because they're making some choices that aren't really in the mainstream um, there are many reasons why people feel alone in this. So I think that getting some, some support and reassuring people that what they're doing isn't crazy if they're cutting out the carbs or if they're eating a lot of red meat, that you know this is totally uh, evidence-based and that they should give it a real try. You know, they, can, they can be open-minded and they can get the support from a health professional uh, like they should. So really you know having more coaching integrated into it bring the human elements um you know ma machine learning is great but it's still not the ai that we would want it to be so i think the human component sort of like what verda is doing mm, right. uh i think is is super important wow dude i love that and it's for the listener like unless you're driving like stop right now download nutrita it is it's a wonderful app if you want to use it long term there's a small fee it's not expensive you can try it for free for seven days it's really well done it's it you can see how much effort went into it it's easy to use there's lots of education available even though you know the coaching component isn't there yet um that will be amazing once you add that i just i really think there's such a value that you guys have created for people that is really lacking i, I just see so many people struggle with you know trying to count calories and manage calories and worry about the wrong things and go down this rabbit hole of like restriction and it crushes their metabolism and then they start gaining weight and then they feel terrible and they think it's their fault and i just i really love how you guys approached it um and yeah i'm super curious to see how that evolves over time as well that's that's great I want, to talk, I want to talk a little bit about um, your current work. So uh, as a biochemist uh, working on your PhD, you've done some very interesting work in cancer, which I, I, you know, I love to talk about. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, in my uh, master's in molecular biology, my thesis was on the subject of cancer. And cancer is, is the disease, I guess, that has taught me the most about um, human health because it's a very fundamental thing that goes wrong in cancer cells. Uh, the the typical mainstream view is that it's it's really all in the genetics. You get some mutations, and this sets off a whole chain of events that mangles your your DNA and and messes with your cells' ability to, you know, uh, inhibit replication. And so it keeps replicating like crazy, and and we get this horrible disease we call cancer. So that's the mainstream view. My view is kind of different. Um, it's mostly metabolism based, meaning I'm more interested in the mitochondria and these little energy powerhouses that sit in our cells and, and give us the ATP, which is the energy that we need to run our machinery. I think those get uh, hit by something. I think there is, it could be radiation, it could be a virus, it could be something else, a defect in the antioxidant system, something that messes them up and has a chain reaction and impacts the nucleus such that the DNA is all tangled up and is mutated and looks like it's been hit by something. And that then this leads to the, the cancer that, that we can then all describe. So I think it's based in metabolism, not in the genetics per se. Um, so that's a pretty different view. And that's something I wanted to explore in my cancer thesis. So I looked in the literature for some cells that are said, uh, that are said to be very uh, good at burning fat despite being cancerous. So these cells would basically be contradicting my perspective on it, which was huh. that, no, 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 the cancer cells are, you know, fermenting glucose. 
um, and glutamine, and they're not good at burning fat because their mitochondria are broken, because that's why I think cancer occurs, because mitochondria are broken, they can't burn fat, and they ferment stuff, and that's what we call cancer. And so I said, okay, let me choose cells that are, that are supposedly the cells that would prove me wrong and let me measure stuff in them and let's see if, if they are in fact a falsification of the theory that I, I so liked. So I, I ordered those cells, they were breast cancer cells, and I compared them to normal breast cells that were totally not cancerous. And what, what ended up happening, what I measured was the lactate to pyruvate ratio. And what this ratio tells you, it's basically, you know, how fermentative of a cell are you? Are you feeding yourself, you getting your energy from glucose and glutamine, what we call fermentative sub substrates? And that would be a sign of a cell who's not burning fat well because it has broken mitochondria. Or are you more like a normal cell? And are you, you know, burning a lot of uh, fat with oxygen in your mitochondria that are functioning normally? And what kind of cell are you? So I'm trying to fingerprint the cell. And when I measured those things, I found that, you know, the, these breast uh, cancer cells were actually really bad at, at you know, um, burning fat. They seem to be producing a ton of lactate, which is really the end product of uh, burning glucose, right? It's glycolysis. So those cells were not giving off the impression that they were burning a lot of fat and most likely because their mitochondria were broken. That's how I would have explained it now. I should have looked at the mitochondria, but you know, that costs a ton more money and <laughs> it's time I didn't have. So in another life, I would like to look at those mitochondria directly, but that that's what my thesis was on. Um, and cancer has been a, a very an interest for mine ever since. Um, but my, my PhD is in something quite different. It's actually in uh, the neuroscience area. And it's, it's looking at schizophrenia in rats, actually, that uh, we, we can make schizophrenic by injecting what's called a cytotactic agent that's a uh, uh, cytotoxic, sorry, agent that's um, affecting their development when they're in utero, right? When they're in their, their mother's, um, when they're in their mother and developing. And this gives them the schizophrenic phenotype that we're looking for. Uh, because we we then give them antipsychotics, and we want to see if those antipsychotics ha are changing their behavior in ways that would suggest, hey, this could work for a schizophrenic. And and so once we make them schizophrenic, and we give them these antipsychotics, uh, it's um, uh, Abilify um, and uh, Zyprexa, Olanzapine. Um, so those are the two antipsychotics that that I look at, and I also gave those rats a ketogenic diets and and tried to understand if the ketogenic diet changes those schizophrenic rats in interesting ways. Mm. Um, so so that's research that I I haven't published yet, but um, I'm I'm gearing up to publish. So that'll that that's the subject of my PhD. Really, it's more in the neuroscience and antipsychotics and ketogenic diet uh, area. Wow. That field of research is just so endlessly fascinating, and the information that we're getting, uh, you know, coming from there, it, I, I don't think anything's proven yet, but it's looking really, really good for the low carb and and those kinds of mental disorders. And I'm, I'm just curious how you think about some of these things. Um, we used to call type two diabetes adult onset diabetes, and we can't call it that anymore because so many young people are getting it. Is that what's going to happen with things like Alzheimer's and dementia? It looks to be going that way, at least. I think that's not a bad analogy because we are, we're seeing people with memory issues, cognition issues, uh, coordination, gait, balance issues uh, way too early. I mean, people are just aging faster in general. Their biological age is older than their chronological age. So, you know, these are even important predictors in, in COVID mortality, biological age is a better predictor than even chronological mortality, which is already a really good one. Um, so I think, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, they're happening sooner. They're happening to more people. And I think we have a pretty, I mean, it's not like we know exactly why they happen in the people that they happen in, but we have a very good idea of what makes it worse. We have a very good idea of what you'd want to avoid if you were, you know, set up from birth, we, you could you could just decide that from birth. We know you don't want to ingest heavy metals, right? We know you probably don't want to have a chronic gum infection, right? Something close to your brain that's infected. 
we know that you probably don't want to jack up insulin in your body by eating lots of sugar and flour because that's going to mess up the uh, neuronal metabolism that that you need, you know, to to not get Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of things we can actually do, and it's the things that are hard to do, right? It's it's giving up those treats. It's uh, getting exercise, walking after your meals, lifting heavy things in a safe way. You know, it's the things that are really maintaining your muscle mass that are also maintaining your brain mass. And you lose your brain mass when you have a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease, for example. So you need to think of, you know, weightlifting as a brain maintain maintenance activity as well than a muscle maintenance activity. And and, you know, people will lift things if they think it'll keep them from, from going demented. And I think it should because it, it can help. So there are a lot of things we know can help. But, you know, from the drug target perspective, oh, man, it's a, it's a catastrophe. I mean, less than 6% of drugs ever make it in that field. You know, we've got, we've got the giants in the pharma, uh, pharmacolo- um, pharmacology industry that have... Uh, taken funding away now from these projects they're they're looking elsewhere because they they their model can't explain the disease they don't understand the disease and i think we're starting to get some better uh some better luck from the people who are taking an evolutionary approach looking at metabolism understanding that you know the cell uh, the, the the brain is also uh, being you know very much influenced by immune cells i mean glia are immune cells in the brain uh, to a large extent, and we have to look at the immunometabolic perspective, and you know, understand the connection between the gut and the brain. This, this, uh, this really, this highway of of metabolites that are being exchanged. So we've got to understand that it's linked to inflammatory bowel disorders, and we've got to start putting those pieces of the puzzle together, um, and understand that a lot of what's going to be good for the gut is going to be good for the brain, and you know, we can we can start uh, attacking that on the nutrition perspective. We can start attacking that on the environmental toxins perspective. There's a lot of things we can do, but but we have to get out of the one drug, one target paradigm. Mm. Uh, we, we have to start looking at this scientifically. Uh, you could say holistically, but for me, it's just it's just uh, scientifically, scientifically. Really, if, you, if you, that's what you care about. Wow. Yeah. I just, I really, for the listener, I really hope you took all of that in because if you've ever lived with somebody who's going through Alzheimer's, you know how absolutely, utterly horrible the disease is. And there may not be the exact proof that we need just yet in science to tell you exactly what to do, but it's exactly what you said. There are things that we know that you can start with, and it doesn't need to be super complicated. There's definitely tools that can help you, and start now. Start now. It'll make a big difference. Just start eating more healthy things. The, the app certainly helps Nutrita. Like all of those tools are so great and you can implore them. I love that you um, talked about lifting. You are, um, you're great at finding different lifestyle tools that can really help you. What other things have you found that help keep you um, balanced in your life? So one of my favorite things to do uh, is cold exposure. So things like ice baths or cold showers, uh, I love these. So it's it's funny because um, I I don't know if you've noticed, but kids will will play in 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 pools in the winter and you know go outside when it's raining, and I think it's reflecting the fact that their metabolism is working better. They they don't mind the cold. They can get the temperature variation, and I think it's part of. It also fits with the fact that their immune systems are pretty robust. I mean, kids, you know. Um, they, they, their immune system has is, is learning, but it's certainly robust. You know, it's it's functioning very well, and I think that's what we lose with age and cold exposure and making. And it's not just the cold; it's also heat exposure. It could be the sauna. It could be. It's just basically temperature variation. If you integrate that in, as part of your lifestyle, whether that's the sauna, that's you know, cold shower, swimming in the river, whatever, um, it can be fun. You know, it's a challenge. Um, I think that's great because it's, I think it trains your immune system. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive what, you know, it's such a, once again, it's super fundamental. Every organism needs to maintain body temperature within a certain range. Um, they have to be adapted to their environment. We know that central heating is a modern thing. Uh, we understand that. So I think if we, if we really take that to heart, I think we can get a lot of out of, uh, a lot out of it. And it's exhilarating, you know, once you learn to, 
to breathe in the cold and, and to be comfortable where you would otherwise be very uncomfortable, that's pretty, pretty galvanizing. It gives you confidence. You know, you, you can do things that's, that are very, very difficult, but are, you know, still quite safe. Um, so yeah, I recommend people look up the Wim Hof breath method, uh, uh, breath work. Uh, that's really great. That's a really great tool to use uh, with cold exposure. Um, so those things, and, and yeah, basically the, the other thing besides exercise, I guess, and, and cold and heat is, uh, yeah, community. Community is crucial. It really what's it's really what gives you quality of life. So it's what you're it's what you're going for. It's what you're investing in when you do hard things so that you will get back on the long term. But you know, getting a, a interesting group of friends together to do some activity or work on a project, or just have someone you can confide in, uh, and and you know not not feel alone. Like I, I know a lot of people feel alone during the pandemic. Um, I think that's an immediate reward, something you don't have to invest in for the long term, but but it is good for you on the long term. And mm. it's something everyone needs. So if if you can find a way to maybe marry even exercise and the sense of community, I think that's why CrossFit has been so popular mm. to some extent, because it, it it meets that overlap for a lot of people. Uh, that's a that's a great thing. So yeah, the simple things in life, like you know, having people around you and being able to to move and and move your body in a way that feels good. Mm, man, I love that. I, I am so grateful for people like you who have taught me these things over the years. I, I remember early on when the when the pandemic was happening, I, I tried to be as sensitive as I could when I when I made this post. Um, but I, I just said like, look, this is what we were trying to tell you. Like we were trying to tell you to lift heavy things. We were trying to tell you to get fresh air, be in the sun, have temperature exposure, do hard things. It's so important to, to be, you know, like you said, like resilient and, and you can handle stress better and breathing in, in and out through your nose and handling temperatures. And again, lifting heavy things, it's so important for our resiliency as humans. And it gives so much, I don't know, it, it's like you said, the simplicity gives all the richness in life. It gives all the, all the great things. And I'm so glad you brought up community as well. Cause I, I just think that's so important. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're working on for the future? So uh, I'm very, very excited about the work that I'm doing with a, a clinic uh, in Portugal that is really going to be taking uh, what, what I think is a very forward thinking approach because uh, I'm working with a, a young doctor and a team of people that really understand the, the basics, the one-on-one of health. Um, you know, they're, they're really... You know, they, they want to do better. They all have some personal story in health and, you know, they see what's happening in the medical system, especially during COVID. And there's a massive opportunity to improve people's health, uh, taking maybe what some people would call the metabolic approach, I guess. Uh, the evolutionary approach would be another way of saying it. But whatever you call it, it's it's people who are going to be looking at lifestyle, who are going to be try to, who, who are going to, going to, try to de-prescribe drugs, get people off their medications, um, catch things early, you know, as best they can. Um, really trying to stay closer to the patient because this is one of the most um, re recurrent themes that I, I keep getting, whether it's in my personal life or in my professional life, that the interaction people have with their doctor uh, colors so much of the medical experience for them. And it's, it's quite amazing uh, whether you attribute that to the placebo effect or something else, the feeling of being supported and being uh, listened to and having a, an interaction where you're not taking orders, but you are being guided um, towards uh, some informed choice, you know, an informed consent in your treatment. I think that's 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 hard to put a price on and it's difficult because it takes time and it takes people who have a lot of patience and it's hard to you know train into someone it's hard to have systems to do that but i think that's the approach that we're going to try to to take in the clinic and hopefully make it a successful model for others to to emulate that that would be the best outcome I could hope for. Wow. That's so cool. What amazing work. This has been such an awesome conversation. I'm so excited that you were able to take some time out of your life to come and talk with us. What is one simple tip that you would recommend for the listener to take out of this conversation and apply in their lives? Oh, that's, that's a hard one. Um, 
I guess if we're if we're looking for something relatively simple, then it's um, yeah, le learn learn about your breath. And the easiest way to learn is to just breathe with using different techniques. There's tons of them. You don't have to start with any particular one, but just become conscious of your breath. It uh, gives a lot of rhythm to your thoughts, to your mood, uh, to your life. And sometimes we forget to to breathe consciously. You know, it's just like posture or these other things. Uh, but it's a big deal. You know, I grew up with asthma and I just remember the anxiety that accompanied the sensation of being breathless. And and as I grow older, you you learn to handle those uh, those anxious moments. And I have always been very appreciative of, you know, uh, you know, good lung function <laughs> and just breathing very freely and having exercise feel good because you can breathe uh, in the right way and handling difficult situations in life by being conscious of my breathing. Uh, it's a really good asset, you know, whether it's for public speaking, whether it's for uh, having a very difficult conversation with a loved one. If you can control your breath, you know, it's it'll give you an advantage in, in areas of your life that matter, what, which whatever it is you're interested in. So yeah, your breath would be a good, a good uh, thing to invest a little time in, I guess. Beautiful. Wow. We, we just could not agree more. We think that is so important. Rafael Satori, where should we send people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Yeah, so you can go to my website, Nutrita.app, and you can download the app there. So this is sort of the, the fruit of, of many years of, of work and distilling all of this into a, a product. Um, so uh, I'll get you guys some coupon codes with with Casey. So when cool. this episode goes up, you'll you'll have that there. Um, and if you so this is for the app, if you want to read a lot of the articles that were written around the app to give people some context for what we're doing, it's nutrita.app slash blog. And you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Raphael PH uh, uh, S7. So Raphael S7. Um, so I'm there mostly posting about nutrition and, and some other stuff, but, uh, that's pretty much it. So the website, the, the app and my Twitter. So thanks for listening and thanks for inviting me on Casey is, is a really pleasant conversation to have with you and we should do this again. I, we would love to, we are so honored, um, to host you on this show. We're so grateful for you and your work and for ma making things simple and accessible for people. Uh, we really just appreciate you and, and all of that stuff. And so thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. We are very grateful for you. Thanks. And this has been another episode of boundless body radio.